Welcome to the assess meeting. It's August 16. Today we have Santiago Diaz to talk, I guess, again about prototype pollution, uh, data only prototype pollution mitigation. And uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I I found our last conversation really, really useful. So um, we started talking about prototype pollution as a class of vulnerabilities, which is something we really care about because uh, there's been a lot of work done to fix cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on the web, but just generally like a lot of improvements to security, JavaScript security. And prototype pollution is uh, an important class of bugs because it's uh, the one example that we have where from using just data, an attacker can actually get code execution on a JavaScript environment. And that is a bit of a paradigm change for us. Um, and I guess in general for, for web security and, and JavaScript as well. So um, it's, an, it's an interesting uh, area of work. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about the threat models that we had in mind working on prototype pollution and those that you guys have in mind. And we determined that uh, it was worth splitting those threat models in two one being data only prototype pollution attacks, which refers to this idea that um, the code that is running in the runtime is trusted. And the things that are not trusted are the data that flows through it, as opposed to um, running code that is untrusted. And then, you know, that has different uh, consequences and different requirements. And so the idea is to. Oh, OK, and this is all in the context of a proposal that is on TC39 at the moment, is in stage one. And I've been gathering some feedback from different, let's call them stakeholders, all of you included, and kind of refining uh, what the proposal should look like. So today, I want to give you an update uh, of what that is. This should be very short, I guess, depending on where the conversation uh, takes us. But I have only about five slides or so. Um, and I want to explain a little bit end to end what uh, working on JavaScript code would look like uh, after this proposal uh, is implemented, right? So yes, the the main goal for this conversation for me is to get your perspective. What do you think about this? Get any comments and feedback that you can give me. Um, more or less, uh, I've tried to include your perspective of the, of the problem. So all prototype pollution beyond um, data only attacks. And I really hope that we can, that that is captured in, in what I'm gonna say right now. So I think we can jump straight to the rationale. So that's like slide three. Um, so hopefully that's enough context uh, for most people to remember uh, where we left off, right? I think, as I said before, this is, or as we said before, this is focusing on data only attacks. So one of the really good realizations I had from our conversation last time is that this proposal is really a complement for freezing primitives that we have in JavaScript. It seems to me that developers will continue to want to have mutable prototypes and continue working with the old JavaScript that they've known and worked with for many years but just not be vulnerable to prototype pollution, right? Um, to some extent, it feels like uh, freezing all prototypes in the chain sort of defeats the purpose of security because uh, it's at the expense of usability, right? We know that prototypes are there to be modified. And so wouldn't it be great if we had a solution that allows us to have mutable prototypes, but uh, just for them to be modified in a secure way? Right. Do you, do you um, want to do, sorry? Do you, do you want to get uh, reactions in real time as you're going, or should I hold reactions to the end? No, absolutely. I think I think as 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 we're going is is probably the best way. Okay. So uh, what we have found in practice is that for the vast majority of code, freezing the prototype chains uh, does not decrease usability that code actually engages in. Uh, the exceptions to that are shims and uh, empirically, the kinds and and shims can can be actually can be explicitly shims or can just be sort of initialized initializing code that does shim like work. Uh, but in all cases, empirically, it seems that all of that work is done in an initialization phase prior to the program uh, actually uh, doing its job, and that once the program is set about doing its job, there's actually strong empirical evidence that it no longer modifies prototypes in the vast majority of cases, clearly not in all cases. 
Yes, so we did touch on this a little bit before. Um, there's a, f a few things to uh, to mention here. So um, the first thing is, uh, you know, the whole conversation about the override mistake and how that makes freezing sort of less adoptable. Um, but kind of imagining that the override mistake just went away, our empirical evidence is that Yes, it's true that freezing top level prototypes can go a long way and in being compatible with many applications, but we would like to find a solution that freezes the end or or protects the entire tree of prototypes, right? Such that um, if we end up in a world where only the object prototype and the array prototype are protected, then uh, we will have bugs that will be exploitable by polluting the prototype of application defined prototypes or types, right? Okay. And because of this, the more you cover in the chain, the more restrictions you add. This is this is one uh, blocker that we have found. A second blocker is that um, we have found that the what we call the freezing point, which is this, uh, this I think you, you've referenced it with shims, uh, tends to move over time. So that is because you um, add new dependencies or you know, refactor your code, things move around. And so it's not always guaranteed that the freezing time, the freezing point that you found today will stay like that in the long run, right? And in the future, it's a fairly bad uh, developer experience in what we found empirically uh, to suddenly have an application that doesn't work. And you know, that debugging process is, is fairly complicated. Um, so I guess those are kind of the main points. We can talk more about that, but um, I think, uh, okay, perhaps the last point that I will mention is that freezing is really a tool for experts in that as a regular JavaScript developer, maybe writing a website or you know some other code base, is not entirely clear what prototypes should I protect and when should I do that? Like what is the risk of uh, finding a freezing point that is very late or very early, right? It seems that freezing is not a very um, opinionated API, right? It doesn't, it's really for experts who know what they're doing. They really know why they're freezing things, when they're freezing them. And I think because of that, it's likely that freeze will not see a very widespread adoption. Or if, he, or if there is a, such an adoption, I don't think it's likely to be complete in that there will always be a prototype that will be left out and exploits that we will be enable, enabled by that uh, mutability. So okay. because of so, that, we, yeah. So what we can do here is agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, the, and I think, yeah, so the, I think the framing that you will have more success with, uh, with this group of people is, that we i think that we agree that developers should pay should uh that there's a like a, a value to cost ratio for each of these types of mitigations and as long as they are complementary and and do not conflict with each other and that we can do both or neither or one or the other um having a cost benefit and a different cost benefit analysis for data only protection versus um versus untrusted code and i is it's like if there is a customer out there who can benefit from a data only mitigation attack but is not in a position to go all the way and pay the costs necessary to mitigate attacks within their own code which do exist no question they are all vulnerable um the that that they should pay for what they get um and like data only protection closes a significant hole for people on a particular security model that is not as strong as as the untrusted code model but they are that but they but ideally we find a solution that is compatible and maybe even mutually beneficial um like if we find Absolutely. a solution if we find a solution to data only attacks that also happens to solve override mistake problems with the with freezing, then not only are we not only are we in agreement with what we're helping. <laughs> um, and, yes. and that's that's the framing I think that you will have the most success with. And so I, yeah. I'm sorry, you should react to Chris first, and then I have a clarification clarification question. 
No, please, please go ahead, and I think I'll I'll reply after yours. Okay. Um, so the uh, the issue about what is a prototype, uh, there is um, JavaScript doesn't have a de jure definition of prototype you, because you uh, you can an object can inherit from any other object, so any object is potentially a prototype to inherit from. There's two de jure uh, definitions that I that I think you uh, you could be reaching for. One is the when you create a function using the function keyword, uh, the the that's um, in, that's endowed with a prototype property that points at a new fresh empty object, and likewise uh, the class construct syntactically um, uh, creates a prototype a, a new prototype object to be the prototype of the class. Uh, do you mean uh, those two as opposed to any object that another object inherits from? So I'm not entirely sure whether I would single them out. Um, I think, um, so absolute ag agreement on the idea that any object can become a prototype. When I talk about protecting the entire chain, I really mean a chain that is dynamic where elements come in and out, right? Um, and because of that, the like, uh, I guess that's a hint to as to whether freezing will do that or not, right? Because, um, I don't think we have a good solution at the moment for being able to freeze an object when it comes into the chain and then unfreeze it when it comes when it goes out. I don't know if that's uh, the sort of what, what you're hinting at, but it, it really the the TLDR of, of what I want to say is that um, it would be great if the entire chain, no matter what objects are it's composed of, uh, are protected when they are uh, prototypes. Okay, and, uh, and by the way. I think, wasn't actually hinting at, at anything in, in this case. So I, I often am, so you're right to be suspicious. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, this, in this case, I was just, just clarification. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Chris entirely. Um, I think this is this is what I meant before by it's it's one of the realizations that I had from our last talk, which is that there is really a different, you know, security is about economics, right? And there is really a different price to pay depending on what kind of user you are. I the way I see it, freeze is a very good tool for power users um, who have who are willing to pay a higher cost because they're willing to take more benefits. Um, but there is certainly a huge amount of code bases out there that are run or maintained by people who are not experts in prototype pollution. And because of that, it would be great to give them an opinionated API that allows them to continue working as usual, uh, but you know, being protected. So this idea of something complementary, something that really resonates with me um, in terms of whether the what we mean when we say complementary means maybe uh, solving or unblocking some of the issues with freeze, like the override mistake. I'm not so sure, but I guess let's continue uh, looking specifically at the proposal and maybe we can um, kind of come across this point um, if that's okay with you. Yep. So I guess from from here is, I, I guess we've said everything is sort of, yeah, I, I, I won't repeat myself. So I think we should be able to go to slide five now which is talking about the proposal per se, right? So to summarize the entire thing in a single sentence, I think what we want to say is that this is a feature that exposes prototypes only to reflection APIs. That's it. Um, it implies that prototypes cannot be reached via regular properties as they are right now, because computed, we, we know that in the uh, data only attacks, computed property is what leads to uh, surprising accesses to the prototypes. So looking for a way to cut that access um, seems like a very promising solution because it really has nothing to do with whether the prototypes are mutable or not, but it has more to do uh, to, on whether data can access those prototypes or not, right? And I will explain what I mean by that. I want to highlight three main uh, characteristics of this proposal. The first one is that it's absolutely not backward compatible. That um, seems like an issue if you bring a new feature by default on JavaScript. And because of that, um, this proposal uh, explains how we can make this into an opt-in feature. We touched a little bit on that uh, previously, but we can talk uh, more about it today. And we'll talk about what that mechanism looks like and so on. 
the next thing is that it's very easy to adopt. So there's basically very minimal changes you have to make to your code base to make it compatible with this feature. And not only that, the changes you have to make are very machine friendly. So you can really um, sort of uh, programmatically apply them or automate them. And there's a little bit about the, the adoption story. I want to give a, a kind of example of what you would do end to end to get an existing code base into a place where OK, an existing code base that opts into this feature um, and it's suddenly sort of protected against uh, data only attacks. And then the final thing is how do you, sorry, Chris, did you want to say something? Uh, I wanted to ask a clarifying question. <clears throat> sure. It's an opt-in feature, but is uh, for a code base that has opted in, and is correct after opting in, is that program also guaranteed to be compatible with a, with a, with a platform that has not opted in? Yes. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but yes, the, the short answer is yes. And also, um, it's very common for many applications to sort of go in and out of uh, security features, right? For different reasons. Maybe your the, your code base is compatible, but you introduce a new dependency that is not compatible anymore. So you need to turn this feature off. And this proposal takes that into account. And so your code base should a working code base or a compatible code base will continue to be compatible on, let's say, a browser or a JS runtime that doesn't support this feature at all, or that you know doesn't opt into it, right? Um, yes. And so, yeah, the last thing is out of band flag, so we can talk about that later. But really, the core of the proposal is in the next slide. Uh, uh, we which... want to point out that out of band flags are an option for this proposal, but would not be an option for the um, for hardened JavaScript, uh, which is a distinction. Okay, that's interesting. The, and the reason being exactly because of what you say about the the point at which you lock down in the environment is a shifting thing that is a concern of the application author. And because of that, it has to be coded in JavaScript. It, it, the, the moment where the environment is locked in has to be identified such that shims occur before and, and application is effectively daemonized afterward. Yeah, I empathize with that. I think uh, some of the use cases we discussed last time where uh, development tools that will hot swap changes in your JavaScript files, and in doing that, they will modify prototypes sometimes. And because of that, like, you know, this 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 topic about the freezing point is it can really add some limitations in terms of what you can do and what you can't. But yes, thank you for the uh, clarification. I, I did not know that. So I think the core of the proposal is what I called unutterable access, which is this idea that we should stop making prototypes available through property keys. Um, the proposal is really about exposing prototypes through reflection APIs only. So just as we have get prototype off and set prototype off today, which work for instance prototypes, so like uh, Donder Proto, uh, we could add a new pair of setters and getters for bot prototype, right? For, or for the prototype property. What that would mean is that um, if we were to expose these prototypes only through reflection APIs, only code that is already running could get a reference to those objects, right? And because of that, data only attacks would be completely out of the question. Um, it would be sort of, uh, uh, you know, a paradox that you could get uh, access to run these functions when you can only execute data, right? Because of that, I called uh, prototypes after this proposal unutterable to data only exploits. One of the things that I added to this presentation, because just in case you remember our conversation from last time, is that we, we discussed a little bit the idea of breaking symmetry between dot notation and bracket notation. If you don't remember, I don't think it's a big deal. I just want to call out that um, that this proposal doesn't break that symmetry because in reality, there will be no way to do dot prototype or bracket prototype anymore. Um, can I, yes. can I so the, uh, clarification? Sure. Is this keyed on the, simply the, the string names, Dunder Proto and prototype, or is this keyed specifically on access to the magic Dunder Proto property that's the um, that's that's on object prototype 
and likewise the property name prototype that's created by the the platform uh, as the as an initial property on function objects created with the function keyword and of classes. Yes, it's an important clarification. So does the let's call them. I don't know what this the spec language is, but uh, so bear with me. But the slots that contain the prototypes and the sort of infrastructure to build them when you create new classes and new objects and so on continues being there. It's just that those slots are not made available through these string property keys, right? Um, which avoids the situation where you have like object uh, square brackets key and you don't know what key is going to be at compile time because it can be anything at runtime and you might end up with a surprise that that uh, statement reaches a prototype, right? So it's really about the string keys. The string keys are, are key <laughs> because um, they are the ones that have this surprise effect uh, that your code might end up inadvertently changing uh, prototypes when it's meant to do something completely different, like copying properties over or you know parsing some JSON string, right? Okay, so there's no prohibition on using these two string names in unrelated contexts to name unrelated properties. Correct, yes. So only under this mode, there would be a restriction in that they don't exist anymore, but otherwise the rest of the infrastructure is still there. And you know when this feature is off, those properties come come back to life again, uh, if you will. So I guess there's a question uh, as to, okay, let's imagine that we got rid of these string uh, keys. What would happen if I call object.property, I wrote property, but it should be prototype, or object.dunderproto, like what would that return, right? And I think there are two options the way I see it. One is simply um, do nothing, which means that you would uh, return, it would be undefined, the property would be undefined on whatever you call it. That seems you know, reasonable, but I think it would be good if we could think about maybe returning a poisoned object, I call it, um, that would throw if you try to access it when you've opt into this feature, right? That would fail loudly, it will fail early, and it would fail close. And I think that's fairly, uh, fairly attractive. Um, of course, whatever you, you know, that piece of logic would need to um, integrate with some kind of host hook to know whether the feature is on or off. And that way, when it's on, throw, and when it's off, return the, the prototype as usual. There is a precedent for this for CSP. I think we touched on this very briefly last time in terms of how the eval function works because CSP can disable the eval function. And so I think there's a bit of um, infrastructure in JavaScript to make sure that you know CSP and uh, eval are kind of in sync. I have, um, a, I have a question. Um, sure. I, I do not fully, and uh, I do not have a full idea in my head of what the mechanism is uh, for this, but I know that a key to this is that you're modifying the behavior of brackets for accessing properties of an object. Is it the, and it's not your proposal to make brackets only capable of accessing own properties. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It's not, it's not changing in any way, um, you know, how we walk up the chain and whether we walk it up or not. Uh, it's, it's not changing that at all. It's, it's simply the idea that the dot property, um, dot prototype property doesn't exist anymore. And dot dunder proto doesn't exist anymore. And let's say, I guess a way of explaining it is you cannot do, you cannot delete prototype, but you can delete dunder proto, right? If you do that on a code base today, then you won't be able to say object dot dunder proto, or you won't be able to say object bracket proto, dunder proto, right? You just won't be able to do that because the property is not there. But you can access the property anyway by saying object dot get prototype off. So this is essentially the same. Make the, you know, do what you guys have done in TC39 for Dunder Proto, but do it also for prototype. That way we will guarantee that if these two properties don't exist, there are no ways to reach the prototype from data only attacks. Um, hopefully that um, clarifies it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> for what reason is it necessary to preserve the ability to walk up the prototype chain 
for bracket access on an object in this mode. What breaks if you don't have that? Or does a significant amount of the web break if you do do that? Like the only the only the only cases where I think it's valid. So JSON JSON parsed data is certainly not a problem for it's not a problem for JSON parsed data. JSON parsed data it consists entirely of own properties, and would and data only attacks I think would entirely be mitigated if brackets were truncated at the uh, were, were, if brackets were only able to access own properties, and then the distinction between Dunder Proto and Prototype is irrelevant. Um, that notably prototype is a property of function constructor objects, which, which are not own properties in any case, uh, on, on instances. So I'm, I'm yes. curious why the simpler solution is not sufficient. It, it does feel like you, a lot of code base, I imagine do need to use bracket notation to access, uh, properties that are not own. The only, I, I, the only cases in my experience are the cases where you're trying to reconstruct something similar to a scope chain and using the prototype chain as the mechanism for that. But that is exceedingly rare. I, th I think one of the differences between the proposal as it exists here and an earlier form um, uh, is that in this, in the, pro the, the, the proposal, as I understand it, we're seeing today uh, is not introducing a change between dot name and square bracket quote uh, name, uh, uh, which I like. I like the fact that there's, that it's not introducing a non-uniformity there. What it's doing is it's simply withdrawing the naming of the um, the properties currently provided by the virtual machine named Dunder Proto and Prototype. It's not inhibiting any other use of those names, but for the ones provided by the virtual machine, it's withdrawing those as string name properties. And instead, if I understand correctly, providing them as internal slots to be accessed only by uh, built-ins, not by string names. Okay, so the proposal is that all construct is that uh, the proposal is that in this mode, any uh, that that function constructors do not produce a dot prototype property on the constructor object in this mode, and likewise, right. object dot prototype dot dunder proto does not exist. The, the the accessor for Dunder Proto is is absent on object prototype. Are there other cases where it's where where these two properties are omitted? So this is an in, this is a very good point um, to to stop over for a moment. This proposal is all about prototype, not about Dunder Proto, because Dunder Proto can be deleted today. You can you can delete the property and essentially essentially polyfill this right. Um, we had oh, so a little bit of a discussion. So the expectation is that if you opt into this mode, it is on uh, that you are obliged to per, to uh, the application is obliged to delete the the Dunder Proto property. So in my opinion, it would be better if both of them got deleted, right? If you're if you're if we're going to design an opinionated API, then might as well go all the way in and delete Dunder Proto and delete prototype. But I just wanted to leave this open for you know to hear uh, suggestions and feedback um, because. You know, it is possible to delete under Proto, but yeah. ideally, I think we would like to delete both under this mode. Yeah, I, I think that my my personal opinion is that uh, that this mode should be coherent, and that that the decision to delete under Proto from object prototype should should co coincide with not so, creating prototype properties on con function constructors or class constructors. I have two questions. <clears throat> um, First, how how much work do you believe it would be for a code base to have their dependencies mostly switch to a, a mode where a dot prototype doesn't exist? Uh, I in in my experience, especially a lot of ES5 code uh, relies on the dot prototype property to uh, create class likes uh, and access class likes uh, prototypes. 
In fact, I think that one of the cases where we run into an, like one of the most common places that we run into property override mistake issues is in exactly the same code. Yes. Most code actually does go and say like, uh, my class dot prototype dot two string equals, uh, and then that blows up uh, because of the prototype, uh, the override mistake. Um, yeah. So what, like if, if codes are good, I assume then it's going to need to change and use this uh, get class prototype off uh, to access the prototype object and then add things on there. Um, but yeah, and to 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 be clear, that also somewhat undercuts the argument that there's a difference in cost to the developer between these two modes. Mm -hmm. Well, I so I agree in principle, uh, but I think uh, under the current regime of the override mistake, uh, there are some like the construct that Matthew just mentioned sort of breaks freeze for you, right? You cannot use freeze anymore, um, and that is a huge cost. Um, whereas because you will have to make sort of application specific uh, changes and and whatnot, but. Um, so I'm I'm not entirely sure I would 100% agree on the change of cost. I I, I acknowledge just to be just to be clear, the change of cost is assuming the override mistake was fixed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it, no, I don't know. No, that is not what I meant. My what I meant is that in both scenarios, if you wanted to use a library, the the most con my 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 point is that in in our experience, we encounter dot prototype in almost exactly the same places that we find override mistake problems. And the mitigation in both cases would be if you were to adopt this mode of mitigation or our mode for mitigation today, the answer is that you as the application author need to patch the code that's offensive to your mode. And that is the, then that cost is the same. But it's not because one refactoring, one patch is generic and the other one is application specific. Um, and that really changes. Sorry, Sorry. How, is it, uh, how is your mode uh, generic? How is your patch so generic? My patch is generic because uh, if I see a piece of code that uses dot .prototype, I can, uh, with a simple AST, replace that line with something that says object dot get prototype off, right? What and that is generic to any code base. But this is, so, this, so, this, so I suppose I was, I, I was getting at something earlier, not even knowing it, uh, which is uh, since this proposal does not change unrelated uses of the name Dunder Proto and prototype as property names, and since JavaScript uh, uh, continues to fiercely resist any attempt at sound static type analysis, um, uh, you can't simply do the AST transformation because then it will, will break unrelated uses of the, of the property name prototype for uses that are unrelated. Right. And, and, and an AST style transformation for the override mistake is actually saner uh, because you can replace it with a uh, define own property, uh, which that is actually safe regardless of uh, regardless of the intent of what prototype actually means. So. Uh, just a few things to, to so, unpack. Uh, rewriting my class dot prototype uh, dot two string can be replaced and rewritten as objects uh, dot define property my class dot prototype two string and then value whatever. Uh, it, it's a transform that doesn't care about uh, that, that doesn't care about the meaning of the dot prototype uh, in this case. I see. Yes. So I think we we come back to the the part of the conversation before where. Um, you you may work around the override mistake, but you still have the same issues we mentioned, which are uh, being able to protect the entire chain and not only a small set of prototypes, right? Being able to uh, have a moving freezing point without and not making any changes to your code and still having a compatible code base. Those, in my opinion, are the things that add up to the cost of 
I, no, I think right. that, I think that, that the wrong that side of the equation. I think that what you're ascribing is an, an is value, not cost. It's a it's an increase in value, not an increase yeah. in cost. The costs are and, clearly the same. And we get back to the moving point at some point, but maybe uh, I, I don't want to derail your conversation. But I, I I would like to convince you that uh, it, it actually is not a moving point. It is a um, it is best practices to follow uh, to immediately uh, freeze uh, any class or objects that you create. Um, but we can we can get back. Maybe maybe actually we should have a presentation on what our best practices are when we uh, when we write code uh, in in this mode. Uh, yeah, and yes, exactly. And our aim with hardened JavaScript is for it to not be an expert feature, but to just be very obvious best practices. Um, okay, I, I guess we, yeah, maybe we can continue the best practices conversation. I, in terms of uh, cost and value, well, I guess if you if you get you know if you can pay the same and get more value, then surely that means that you've paid less. Uh, but I guess that's kind of philosophizing about the the analogy, and and I'm not not sure if if we get much from it. I I think um, you know the I I would like to to because, get direct I, feed. I do not. Sorry? I do not disagree that there is a difference in total price, or or or, or the uh, or a difference in the cost to benefit ratio, but but just for the, uh, I I'm only I only argue that for the purposes of an honest argument that the costs are the same. Um, I actually would like to get my uh, to my second point, and it's more of a clarification on my understanding of uh, prototype pollution style attacks. Um, from my recollection, it is possible to perform some pollution uh, through the constructor property. Uh, so, for example, you have, you know, one, two, three dot constructor uh, dot whatever equals, and then now you can go and set a property on the constructor. Um, is is this type of pollution out of scope uh, and only focusing uh, and is this solution only focusing on the prototype based pollution? Yes, correct. And I think this is a super important question uh, because this is something we've been working a lot on is basically what kinds of exploits can I write practical exploits that lead to some actual security impact if I use this, which let's call it a constructor pollution, right? There's a few things to, to unpack here. Uh, one is that we need to remember that because we're talking about data only attacks, um, there's a very, very good chance that the value of that statement that you said, one, two, three, dot constructor, dot who equals something, is basically 99% of the cases, if not 100, because we've, we haven't found one uh, where this isn't true, is a string, right? Because you're using, you only have access to data. You cannot create functions, you cannot create complex objects. And so um, with that in mind, going after what we call gadgets, which is other pieces of code that will read that property and do something with it that will subvert its logic or something. Um, this is, we haven't found a single example of this. Um, and there is, this makes sense because uh, the reason why we focus on prototype pollution is because we want to get rid of spooky action at a distance, right? We want to uh, stop this idea that I can affect the status of the runtime somewhere in a completely different corner of the runtime just by having access to a single object, right? And there is no evidence uh, to say that the constructor pollution can achieve that. But there's certainly evidence uh, to say that prototype uh, pollution can do that. So I think the the answer to the question is yes, we are. Uh, the scope of this proposal is solely prototype pollution and not the uh, constructor, let's say, pollution. Yeah, I'm trying to remember a uh, previous job I encountered a uh, pollution-based attack, and I'm not sure if it was actually triggerable only by constructor or, or if at some point you needed access to a prototype but because um, the thing is that through the constructor product property you can reach the function you can reach objects can you reach objects i know you can reach, fu reach function um but yeah it's possible yet yeah, you cannot reach anything that 
would cause more mayhem without having a uh, further pivot point. Okay. So I, I can give you a couple of examples of the kind of uh, things that we've tried to work out. Uh, maybe they they can uh, help, you know, have an idea of what those attacks might look like. Um, but they are like, they're just not practical and they're not realistic. So one of the things you can do is reach the includes function. Let's imagine that you have a function that copies properties from one uh, source object to a target object, right? Just arbitrary properties. So you could modify the logic of that function to replace the includes function and make, for example, the string includes be the array includes. And that means that if you have a piece of code that says, I don't know, uh, does the username include the word admin, you could subvert that logic, right? So this is the kind of theoretical issues that we've been looking into and trying to explode in, exploit in, in real code bases. But there's really no evidence that you know, this is practical in, in any of the places that we've seen. There's one bug um, that looks, you know, it's a real bug, uh, but doesn't seem very valuable. And is that there was this application with a feature where you can basically pass, um, you know, then the, a set of properties and it will call those property, it will fetch a function uh, from those properties and call it on an object. So these people managed to go through the constructor and get access to object.assign um, so that object.assign would be called on an object that they controlled, which was the user profile, and set the ID of their user to one. And that's an evaluation of privileges through object.assign. Now that attack would not be protected by this, but that attack is arguably an attack against a specific logic in an application that allowed users to call arbitrary functions on arbitrary objects. And that is really not what we're talking about here, right? Um, so I guess maybe those are those are a couple of examples. There are some references to them uh, publicly. I would be happy to share that, um, but just to have an idea of what constructor pollution could or could not do in the future. There's, there's a data only prototype non-pollution, attack that uses you know, prototype inheritance data only from JSON uh, uh, that uses uh, constructor navigation, not prototype navigation, um, uh, that Mike Samuel uh, demonstrated that looks plausible uh, and that cr uh, cr brings about arbitrary code execution without having poisoned any prototypes. Are you familiar with that? I'll, I'll, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll find it for you. And, and send it, it. Would, it would be great to see that, yes. Um, I think I could add a little bit of more context about why we've chosen prototype. The original proposal chose constructor. We do exactly this, but on constructor. Um, but arguably, that makes the, the proposal a little bit more complex. And the reason is because um, OK, there's a few reasons, actually. The first one is that, well, constructor is found in a lot more places than prototype, right? And just because of that, it's like, you know, it's maybe maybe prototype is marginally easier to roll out to, to, you know, programmatically change, as we said, than constructor. But also constructor, there were some um, kind of concerns that were raised on the GitHub repository for this proposal, saying that constructor is different from prototype in that constructor is a property that is uh, that code bases could reasonably overwrite to make it point to something that is completely different, that has nothing to do with constructors, right? Whereas you would not be able to do that with prototype. In terms of prototype pollution, wait, 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 Sorry, hold on. The, you can, the, even the built-in prototype properties, you can point them at any object at all. So I not yes. I didn't understand the difference that you're claiming between prototype and constructor. There. Not the class one. The class one is. Uh, ah, okay, but the but the one exactly. creating the function keyword. Yeah. The, the property is non-configurable, but it is writable, and you can point it at anything. I don't believe it. Yeah, the the, the function the one, one, but not the the class one. Okay. But yeah, the but but the function one is a big deal. Um, one reason I brought up constructor is uh, because conceptually, uh, 
it is an innovation of privilege to be able to reach the constructor uh, of a class through only an instance, like having access to only an instance object, giving you now the capability of, uh, of, of building any new instance of that object is, uh, is can, can be in some in some programs can can, can constitute an elevation of a, a privilege. So uh, I was originally interested in in, in this proposal because uh, censoring constructor and, and basically making that part of a part of the language uh, subset of the language uh, would help us reason about like the fact that we censor uh, constructor uh, sometimes ourselves. Matthew, can you explain a little better what you mean by, so I think you're describing an attack where you can instantiate new objects. Is that is that what you meant? Yeah, if you have code execution and you have access uh, to a, yes. uh, an instance of, a, a, of an object, you might, like, Al is giving Carol an instance of Bob does not mean that Carol also then should be able to create new Bobs. Um, where, Currently, with the dot constructor proper, uh, property, it's very easy to uh, to do that if you have access to an instance. Yeah, in particular, yes, absolutely. When we introduced Sorry. weak references, we were concerned about exactly this elevation of privilege, so we made the dot constructor property on the weak ref prototype uh, optional, so that a an implementation could omit it and still be standards conforming. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yes, so I guess we come back to the thread models here. Um, I think this is the kind of things you can have uh, when you have code execution, uh, but when you don't have code execution, there's really no way to, uh, through a handle to the prototype, uh, instantiate new objects. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess this is sort of discussion on, on the core part of the proposal. Um, maybe let's cover the remaining two or three slides. Um, just to get a, a good kind of round, rounded view of, of what this looks like. So this is feature flags, which is essentially how do I opt into this, right? Um, the original proposal discussed a few different alternatives. Uh, I will not kind of lead with them. I will just say that uh, there weren't very many uh, good alternatives there and different DC39 uh, delegates uh, sort of felt that, you know, a new mode is not necessary, like doing something like, you know, object dot enable new security feature is just creates a bunch of compatibility issues. So uh, we've landed on this idea of out of band feature flags, right? Uh, and what that means is maybe you set a response header that says, you know, encapsulate my prototype, or maybe you set a flag like a binary flag in Node.js that says encapsulate my, my prototype. This is simply the way you opt in or opt out of, of the feature. And as we said before, when the feature is disabled, you can access prototypes both via the reflection APIs and via their property keys. Whereas when the feature is enabled, you're only able to use the reflection APIs, right? So this is, I think, kind of the mechanics and implementation details of how you would uh, opt into it. I don't know if there's anything to say here. Um, I do have a question. The, with regard to the coarsening that you're, that, that you're attempting here with the, the, out, the out of bandness, uh, in the browser context, uh, this would still be per browser created realm in that two realms of the same origin, one might have opted in and one might have opted at, one might have not opted in. So uh, I assume you're familiar with the shadow realm proposal? Um, only very vaguely. Uh, I think maybe does it make sense if we talk in in on the web we talk about browser contexts where you know you don't have this concept of web dom web origins but is basically a collection of um, functions that came from different places and all live within a single runtime is that uh, like a yeah. analog? Most likely, most likely we can I assume this is applying basically to a window more or less uh, and all yes the, exactly all the same origin realms in a window. Okay, so so since you're not that familiar with it, let me just suggest uh, uh, for you to take a look at the shadow right. realm, the shadow realm proposal, uh, and to I, I want to suggest that you think about whether uh, the corresponding sort of the equivalent coarsening, if there's a reason for it to be this coarse, the equivalent coarsening uh, would be for it to be an option 
um, uh, in the, on the shadow realm construction to be able to create a shadow realm that had opted in. Most okay, likely, so applied through this mechanism, it would be applied uh, to sh any shadow realm uh, implicitly created by the, the, the window. Uh, it, yeah, I, I don't know if it should be an option, but given the plumbing of the current plumbing of window context, I, I would assume that wouldn't be the case. <laughs> I think it would be fairly difficult for a browser, um, if I understand correctly what we're what we're talking about, to figure out uh, right at the point where a line of code is going to run, whether this code came from a context where the feature was enabled or not, because that will imply that there is provenance information that needs to be kept for every defined symbol, right? And it's very likely that an implementation like that is is just extremely complex to to pull off. I, th I think that the book, I think you'll find that the, I mean, you, you're inside Google and I'm, I no longer am. So you, you'll, you'll be able to get this question answered much better than I can for, at least for V8. But I think you'll find that the bookkeeping needed to support this on a per shadow realm basis is the same bookkeeping that's needed to support it on a per iframe basis. Okay, so I guess, yeah, I guess may maybe it would be interesting to read a little bit more about Shadow Realms. I will I will certainly um, ask about this, and I think if, if that is useful for you as well, I think I'll, I'll get back to you on an answer on that. Um, yeah. Uh, let's say that, you know, as, as an initial strawman, it seems that being able to uh, freeze your browsing context um, is a way in which you can reason about the runtime in general, right? You can reason about the fact that, you know, the property just doesn't exist in this, no matter where the scripts came from. And I think there's an advantage to that, but maybe uh, Shadow Realms have has some innovations on top of this. Uh, I think. Yes, we're over time and I get to cut you off so that folks can move on to their next meetings. Um, I, I encourage you to please share your deck with the set strategy mailing list. I'm glad that we got through the portion we did. It was a great conversation. How, how many slides were left? Two, I think. You want to just quickly flip through them before we terminate the recording? Sure. Yeah, we are here on compatibility. This is basically just giving examples of what the refactoring would look like. So I think that's it. Uh, the last function is vulnerable when the feature is not on, and it stops being vulnerable when the feature is on without any changes. That's That's it. That's the end of that slide. And then uh, the very last one is basically talking about like how the refactoring is machine friendly. It does touch a little bit on the third party dependencies, which uh, or sort of yeah, third party dependencies that Matthew uh, talked about. And finally, I think an important part is that um, this proposal is polyfillable, right? So this means that you can have uh, you can refactor a code base. Um, uh, to make it compatible, and that code base should be able to run just as usual on an older browser or older version of Node.js, right? And this is, uh, yeah, talking about adoption. Anyway, thank you so much for uh, the space. I think I, I have some interesting comments, and uh, yeah, let's continue the conversation. Yeah, and, pl and please come back and let's let's continue the conversation because I'm sure there's there's there will continue to be a lot to discuss. Yeah. Sure. The agenda is open next week. If you are available, we'll we'll talk together out of band, I think, for scheduling purposes. All right. Sure. All right. Thank you. I it was a really nice simplification. Uh, uh, I think it has value. I, I would definitely love to talk more about our uh, model of uh, uh, hardening uh, to make sure that so that we can convey that it's not entirely for experts. <laughs> And okay. it is pretty, and it, that there is clear uh, points when things should be hardened or not. Okay, and then in that conversation, let's also talk about like whether with the the protection of the entire prototype chain versus uh, yeah. being able to freeze only top level prototypes. Yeah. Right. Yes. All right. All right. Have a good Thank one. Much. Bye.